In this lesson, we're going to be talking about how we can calculate the heat of a phase change. So we're going to be looking at what the difference is between kinetics and potential. So we'll be looking at the difference between kinetic and potential energy. We'll be examining them on the phase change diagrams. We'll also be talking about our heat of fusion and our heat of vaporization. So kinetic and potential energy can be read on a phase change diagram. The temperature, which is always the y-axis, which is either in Celsius, Fahrenheit, or Kelvin, is the average increase or decrease in kinetic energy. So if you're going from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius, that's an increase in kinetic energy. But the inverse, 100 to 0 degrees Celsius, will be a decrease in kinetic energy. When the kinetic energy changes, the potential energy will always remain the same. So when the temperature does not change, kinetic energy is constant, but your potential energy changes. That is a very important fact that is always asked on the regions. So when we look at our phase change diagram for endothermic phase changes, and don't forget, endothermic means gaining heat. That means heat is going into the sample. You can also determine that it's endothermic because you notice on the left where you're starting, you're at a very cold temperature. And on the right, you end at a very high temperature. So as you go up, you'll notice at the solid phase, there will be an increase in kinetic energy, but there will be no change in potential energy. Same thing for the liquid and gas phase. When you have a solid liquid or gas, you can only increase their kinetic energy. As they get hotter and hotter and hotter, they eventually have to undergo a phase change with the exception of gas. So when you get to the phase change themselves, so from a solid to liquid, which we call melting, or from a liquid to a gas, which we call vaporizing, there is no change in kinetic energy. How do I know this? Because there's no change in how high that line is on the y-axis. It doesn't move from the zero spot. It changes across the x-axis, but not the y-axis. As it does that, the potential energy will be increasing, but the kinetic energy will not change. Same thing now for exothermic. How do I know this is an exothermic graph? Well, when I start, which is the bottom left-hand side of this chart, we're at a very high temperature. That temperature is dropping to something below zero degrees as we end. This is telling me that we are losing heat or heat is leaving the chemical reaction or system. This is what exothermic means for heat to leave. So as we start to cool our different phases of matter, like gases, liquids, and solids, we'll notice that we have a decrease in kinetic energy. But when they get to the phase changes, there's going to be no change in the kinetic energy at all. You'll notice that because, again, the lines do not change on the y-axis. The value does not go up or down. Instead, it just changes across the x-axis, which is the amount of time that passes. So during the, so during the condensation phase, you're not changing the amount of heat, but instead, the gases are converting themselves into liquid. Once they're in the liquid phase, they can then chill themselves or slow their particles down until they get to the freezing phase, which then at the same time, there is no change in temperature, but instead, the particles will be realigning themselves back into the solid form. So let's look at this endothermic graph one more time. So when we're at that solid to liquid phase, which we are looking at right here, we're going to call this the heat of fusion. Heat of fusion is the amount of heat absorbed by one mole of a substance when it is melting into a liquid. So the heat of fusion is going to be an endothermic reaction. This means that the delta H, or the change in heat, is going to be positive. It has to be positive because you are going from a solid to a liquid. That means you're absorbing heat. This means you're gaining enthalpy. However, if you were to go the reverse route, this is the heat of solidification. This is the amount of heat lost when one mole of a, of a liquid solidifies. This is going to be exothermic. When heat is lost or heat leaves a system, that means your delta H is going to be negative. That means the heat is less than it was originally. This is what we also call a loss in enthalpy. The heat of fusion formula is found on table T. It is Q is equal to MHF. HF represents the heat of fusion. And the heat of fusion is represented on table B, which for water is 334 joules per gram. 
On the Regents, they will always ask you questions about how much heat or energy it takes to either melt or freeze a sample of water. So how much heat is required to melt 250 gram block of ice at zero degrees Celsius? So we're gonna use the formula Q is equal to MHF, or the amount of heat is equal to mass times the heat of fusion. So when we plug it in, we wanna know what Q is because Q is our unknown. Our mass is 250 grams and our heat of fusion for water, which is ice, is 334 joules per gram. It's a positive value because we want to melt the sample. So when I multiply the two together, for 850 grams, I will need 83,500 joules of energy to make it melt. So let's do the inverse. How much energy is lost when 45 grams of water solidify into ice at zero degrees Celsius? So looking at what we have, we wanna know how much energy, so our Q is equal to X, our mass is equal to 45 grams, and now, because water wants to solidify into ice, that is exothermic, that means our HF value is going to be negative. So when we do 45 times negative 334, we'll notice that we have to lose about 15,030 joules of energy. So the next phase change we're going to talk about is between the liquid and gas phase. At this point, we have what we call the heat of vaporization. Heat of vaporization is the amount of heat absorbed to vaporize one mole of a given liquid. This is an endothermic reaction because the amount of heat required has to increase as you go from a liquid to a gas phase. So that means our change in heat, or delta H, is going to be positive. This means we are gaining an enthalpy. But the reverse happens if we are going to be cooling down a gas into a liquid. The heat of condensation is the amount of heat lost when one mole of a vapor, which is a gas, condenses into a liquid. Because of the fact that it is losing heat or heat is leaving the system, it is an exothermic reaction. This means that our change in heat, or otherwise known as enthalpy, is going to be a negative value. The formula for our heat of vaporization can be found on reference table T. It is Q is equal to MHV. The heat of vaporization is found on table B, and that is 2260 joules per gram. The regions will always ask you questions on how much energy it takes to vaporize a sample of water, or it will ask you how much energy is lost when water vapor is condensed into liquid water. So let's try this one. How many joules does it take to vaporize a 152.1 gram sample of water at 100 degrees Celsius? So we know that our sample is water. We have a 152.1 gram sample of it, and we want to know what our Q value is. So Q, our unknown, is equal to 152.1 times 2260 joules per gram. I got that value right off of table B in the reference table. It's a positive value because I want to turn water into a gas. So therefore, when I simplify the side, I get 343,520 joules. That is a lot of energy for a 152.1 gram sample of water to undergo. So let's do the reverse now. Let's calculate the amount of joules required for 83.9 gram water vapor to condensate at 100 degrees Celsius. So again, we're using the formula Q is equal to MHV, but now we're gonna be using a negative HV value. The reason why is because we want vapor to turn into a liquid. So therefore, we're gonna do 83.9 times negative 2260, and that tells us that we need to lose about 189,614 joules of energy for this phase change to occur. As you increase the temperature, the intermolecular forces is going to weaken. As you go from a solid to gas phase, the forces weaken as the temperature increases. But in the reverse happens. As you go from a gas to a solid, the intermolecular forces start to increase.